like they don't see me. I'll end with this. I tell everybody this everywhere I go. I always end with my slap remark because they're going to bring that up over and over again. And I just want to confess to y'all because I know when I get out there, they always bring it up. If you say something, they're going to hold you to that for the rest of your life. I was at a reparations rally and the people were mulling around, it was about 50, 60,000 people, you know, Jesse, all of them talking, and I just saw the people moving. So I got up there and I said, man, let me just stop these people from moving around. You know, pick, you know what are you going to say up to Jesse Jackson, Farrakhan? So I was trying to think of something. I threw my little speech away. So I got up there and said, brothers and sisters, y'all be still. And they stopped. I said, oh, shoot. <laughs> it worked. I said, man, talking about reparations, we sitting on some lawn, marching and rallying for some reparations. We should be talking about some scorched earth. They said, yeah! <laughs> and I said, plus, what are we doing on the lawn? Let's go to the Treasury Department. Let's take our reparations. They said, yeah! <laughs> Ain't no money in the Treasury Department. They just write checks. So I'm talking, then I said this, and this stuck with me for the rest of my career. When I get back to New York City for my black mental health, I'm going to slap the first white man I see and tell him it's a black thing. They said, yeah. But I didn't know. I'm talking to you, C-SPAN, ABC, NBC. When I got back to New York, oh my god, it was the, oh man, my whole staff, they said, what did you do in Washington? The papers, a man. White men called me up from all over the country. I kid you not. They said, Councilman Barron, uh, I'm a white man from Indiana. Come slap me. <laughs> they love me. Councilman Barron, I'm from Detroit. Want to slap a white man? Come slap me. So finally, one of them called up. He said, I'm from wherever. You want to slap a white man? Come slap me. I said, ho, 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 you sadomasochistic fool. What are you doing calling me up asking me to slap you for? You need therapy. I said, you want to get slapped? You look in the mirror and slap yourself. I'm busy. I thought I was going to have to get you and go across the nation and have a slap happy time. I mean, I'm telling you, I was flooded with calls. Then they, they emailed all of my council colleagues, they wanted to kick me out, the media was saying I was a racist. So in the morning, I promised to do this uh, radio program with these conservative guys, you know, just for exercise. I was messing with the black and white conservatives. So they said, good morning, councilman. You know, how are you doing? They had the quote, I can tell. You know, they be licking their chops when they got you. So good morning, I said, good morning. So how you doing? I said, great, I feel great, great time to be alive. They said, uh, oh, just a minute, uh, for my black mental health, I'm going to slap the first white man I see and tell him it's a black thing? Did you say that? I said, absolutely. They said, councilman? I said, yes, yes, absolutely means yes, that's what I said. They said, well, do you want to explain it? I said, sure, and I just to mess with them. I said it was a case of oratorical improvisation and black hyperbole. He said, what? I said, oratorical improvisation and black hyperbole. He said, what's a black hyperbole? I said, a hyperbole is a figure of speech. You know, you have metaphors, you have simile, and you have hyperbole, a gross exaggeration. He said, I know what a hyperbole is. I said, well, why'd you ask me? So he said, what's a black hyperbole? I said, oh, well, when I was a little boy and I got on my mama's nerve on Sunday, she said, boy, I will slap you into Tuesday. <laughs> Sir, Monday was still going to happen. That's a black hyperbole, <laughs> a gross exaggeration. He said, give me another one. I said, well, my mama told me I brought you in this world. I will take you out. That's not my mama's commitment to murder. That's a black hyperbole. He said, oh, so you were just kidding around. I said, no, my mama wasn't playing with me and I ain't playing with you. God bless y'all, y'all take care.
give the African man some more love. Thank you. And this time, we're going to bring up one of the most powerful elders we have in this movement. Brother Baba Yolanda Brown. This is one of the greatest Pan-Africanist leaders that we have right now in the African world. I need everyone to please stand up and give this African elder some love. Come on, Anya, come on, come on. Bring it on, come on. You love it. Bring it on. This brother is a great example of total work for the liberation of African people. He has worked for every single state in Africa for the liberation of those states. Every single African state, he has worked for the liberation of them. Every single state in Africa. Every single guerrilla, a freedom fighter, fighting against white imperialists, Ilomibra is and was their advisor. Come on now, give him some love. Brothers and sisters, comrades and friends, beloved African family, and thank you very much, Brother Menelik. Now, I'm not going to say I was going to individually talk to every African leader to advise them. What I'm going to say is that what we have said and put out here is for every African leader, every African person in Africa, in the diaspora, within the United States, within the Caribbean and Central and South America, in the Pacific Islands, that we have worked for all of them because we work for the total African population, the African people. We are Pan-Africanists, we are for African liberation, we're not to oppress anybody else. But you heard from my uh, future congressman, <laughs> you heard him, you understand where we're coming from. Uh, one of the things that Charles Barron said, he talked about Jan Smith. Jan Smith was the tyrant and was hanged African people every day uh, because they fought against the liberation who had the nerve to come from Europe because he was sick, had consumption, and he, they told him to go to Africa so he could get well. He got so well, he gave us hell. He messed African people up. He said, he gave the example of the land question. And on August of the uh, 17th, on Robbie's birthday in 2002, while our people were having a major demonstration in Washington, D.C. for reparations because we couldn't be there. We were on Smith's farm. Took a delegation to Zimbabwe to see for themselves what was happening there and supported uh, Charles Barron when he invited Mugabe to come to the United States. But when he said, the, I, he put forth the idea that Smith had a land now that was almost as big as uh, Central Park. Let me correct you. I have to correct my I'm the African advisor. I have to correct him on that. See, one of the major weeklies said that Young Smith had two plantations of 10,000 acres apiece. Now, see, I was born in Brooklyn, and I don't know anything about no old land. You know, if I had been born in the Caribbean, I would have known about land. If I'd been born in the South, I would have known about where I'm from. But coming from a, a city background, I didn't have no idea what acreage was. So I said, let me try to get an example of what we're talking about. So I checked out Central Harlem, which was, I think, about 800 and, uh, maybe 890 uh, acres. 
Central Park was 843. So I said, let me just add them together. It came out about 1740 or something like that, you know, acres. So that meant that if you, if Smith had land that was twice the size, which was like the size of Central Park and Central Harlem together, Central Park is from 110th Street up to uh, 110th Street, down to 59th Street, and from about West End, West End Avenue to 5th. So we got that figured out. And then we said Central, and then Central Harlem was from 155th Street down to 110th Street, and from about, yeah, almost west, east side of West Side, but not even that. I said going from 5th Avenue to about, you know, maybe Amsterdam, somebody like there. That meant that Jan Smith had land in Zimbabwe that was 11 times the size of Harlem and Central Park together. Now, how did somebody fathom up that idea that he would take that amount of land? And why would we discussing it when Mugabe, who fought them, conquered them, but could not take the victory because Kissinger said, look, we can't let them do this. If they take the victory like this, it's going to show the other people what they can do. So as a result, what they did is that they got, they bombed Mozambique, and they bombed Zambia, two of the front line states, killing people there, until the Mozambicans and the Zambians said they could not take this anymore because the, the frontline states were taking this, this whipping and too many innocent people were getting killed. So Mugabe, along with Joshua and Como from Zappo, Mugabe from Zappo, they had to accept a negotiation that fell short of if he had actually been able to fight to the end and take Salisbury, which is now Harari, and then they would have had a situation where you come like Fidel. You or the fact that you come in on a tank. See, when you come in on a tank, you don't have to ask nobody what the deal is. Because the deal is the tank. That's the tank. See? But when you actually got to go, when you get them to take you into another space of negotiations, you had to negotiate a, a deal that allowed for these few whites to be able to control the foreign, the, the, uh, the front future of Zimbabwe. For 10 years, being that the country would be independent, but they couldn't change the land question or anything else until 10 years. The reason why I'm telling you this is because you're going to be asked, this, particularly all of the people in this hallowed institution, because I think that the, uh, the shrine of the Black uh, Madonna is one of the most important institutions. As a matter of fact, I tell you, every time I come to Atlanta, and I think about what I see here, besides being so many people from you know, New York, <laughs> that came from New York, what I notice is that this is how it used to be in Harlem. Because when we started in Harlem in 1959, we're getting rid of the word Negro for the convention, and then starting to go to a black country with black women the wearing their hair natural and talk about it, stolen the beauty and the virtue of the black woman. Uh, conscience started to rise because when people start to ex respect their own women, once you respect the mother of the world, then anything else follows suit. You know, you ain't got to go no further than that. And it's important to see the sisters in this church, you know, dress in their attire that gives them the dignity of the church. That you're far advanced than white people. They run around, can you have a woman? So they talk out of both sides of their mouth. They talk about the Virgin Mary. They talk about all these other things that are supposed to be so great. But if you ask them about, well, can a woman have a place in the church? They say no. Mm -hmm. Just like that. And you got to debate. You got to go to the Supreme Court. So for us to be emulating the people who are our emulators, they learn from us. There's no question about it. It's not because, uh, Reverend Mendeley said that, or because Charles Barron said it, or that, or that uh, Professor Jefferson is going to say that, is because it's true. They're the ones who came with Lucy. 
They're the ones who came over this thing of where mankind was where first found. They don't go into a situation saying that that Africans now are what they said they were before. They had people going out to see movies like King Kong. And people go out to see it. You know, they think it's just a picture about a gorilla. You know? But the fact is that, as Carlos Cruz pointed out, that King Kong, the movie, was actually a dehumanization of the great Mani Congo of the Congo. The great leader of the Congo, a place where they say it was a jungle, but had more dynasties than, say, Belgium, which came along later on to take over that particular case, that country, which is 80 times larger than Belgium. And the metaphor for the gorilla, who was supposed to be in this place on Skull Island, where every year they would bring a black virgin for this gorilla, whatever that means. But this time it been a white woman and the gorilla went crazy. <laughs> the gorilla, they said, you know who that is. I mean, the gorilla, their argument was that if there was anything such as Darwin, you know, theory, that the gorilla was the black man. And so the whole thing is about this kind of vision there where this gorilla is so fascinated you know, that he's going to follow the, you know, the white woman all the way from the jungle, all the way to New York, and then climb the Empire State Building. So, subliminally, when we talk about the subliminal uh, dynamics of how we think and record things, gives you a lot to understand when you start to think about how we think about ourselves. Well, Dr. John Hunter and Clark told you that you want to understand what, how to get back your manhood that look in the mirror. And when you see that image in you and realize that that image is the same, you know, as you're saying that you want to look like God, the image in the mirror is God. Yeah. Well, because you have an image that that's the reason why this is the shrine of the black Madonna. Oh, yeah. When you see that, you're looking at that, you know what you're looking at. You understand that, you have respect for that, you will fight for that, you will die for that. And until we get to that level of consciousness that we had one time, we came into this world like that, then we will not be free until we actually internalize that to the point where you want to understand why Charles Barrett said he wanted to slap that white man. We are standing right now at a time where we had the worst administration in the history of this country. Didn't just come here. This is a long plan thing. Huh? No, I mean, as far as uh, 911, we know who did it. We know, I mean, I don't know what the white community, they don't want to deal with it. But we don't be asking that is our, you know, Osama bin Laden. We know this thing was allowed to happen for a particular reason. You ever hear what they say to you? They wanted another Pearl Harbor? Yeah. You know what they mean by that? Yeah. See, a lot of people don't understand what it means. What they're telling you, and this is what they, that has been found out, that the whole thing against the Japanese they bombed Pearl Harbor was really a setup. It was a setup because the United States intelligence agency had decoded the Japanese code and knew that the Japanese were getting ready to intervene in their space, in their territory, not in the Atlantic Ocean, not in the you know, Caribbean Sea, but in their area. And so Roosevelt and them allowed for it to happen. And it meant that they did that like they did before in other instances, when you have a reason for you to use military intervention. And as a result of that, when they say about, when they talk to you about the Pearl Harbor reasons, I mean, you, you, know, you have to understand that we need a Pearl Harbor, it means we have to have another incident that will allow for the United States to do what it wants, which is to grab the oil in the Middle East and the gas in the Caspian Sea, i.e. Afghanistan area. And so, I'm just saying that because you should be able to connect these things when you look and see where, where Dick Cheney 
who is probably the real president, you know, but not the real leader either. Because that whole thing was a setup that when George Bush first said he was going to run, I think this is very important for you to understand because this is what we have to deal with with people who don't know. When they first said that George Bush was going to run, this, this is George W. Bush, they said that he would be a very difficult choice because people knew about his past history, you know, until his father cleaned him up in the church and put him back out and got him off the drunk to drink drinking, uh, uh, drink, uh, dealing with drugs and all that kind of stuff. This is all been documented, so don't, don't tell uh, Cardinal Chewy that he's going to come and close, close the church now, you know, because we can document what we're really saying. The fact is that they were black people and left-wing people who were supposed to be very progressive had said that it didn't make any difference who you vote for. And I'm not promoting the Democrat or Republican Party because we've got to go back in 1801, Thomas Jefferson created the Democrat and Republican Party. So that's what the Labour Party was when it started off, the Democrat and uh, Republican Party, and they made out this for about a quarter of a century. So the thing about well, you know, they, they, they're the same. They're the same, but we also have to have tactics and strategies. So they said that, you know, it's always freely dumb, freely deep. It's always that we got to vote for the lesser of the two evils. And I said that, yeah, I understand all that, but this is not a choice of the lesser of two evils. This is a choice of blocking the greater evil of the two lessers. That's what we were fighting against. The two lessers, whether it was Gore or Bush, the same thing was you know who was behind this, this person, this George Bush. And what you should realize too, we show you how they stole the election and how black people were so incorrect. Even with the nationalists, when we all said don't vote. Because what it meant, why would they spend so much money to steal our vote and do go to the lengths they did to steal our vote if we were going to take an easy way out and say we weren't going to vote anyway? And we did have people come on to a radio and television saying, you know, they, they came on first and said, we don't want to vote. Vote's wrong. Shouldn't be voting. And then when this thing switched up, they came back and said, see, see, you see, they stole our vote. So you can't have it both ways. The fact is that the vote was important because black people had an option to try to tailor the future. And this future is one that's uh, completely tied in to our connection to Africa. Garvey, you know, when Garvey came many, many years ago, the 1920s, and when he put down what was the forerunner with the African Orthodox Church, the Universal African Orthodox Church, which is the forerunner of the Shrine of the Black Madonna. Now, that means that we knew that about <laughs> at least 80 years ago. And he gave a plan. What we've been doing recently with the Pan-African movement is trying to create the plan, but really we'll be trying to refashion the plan because the plan is already there. As a plan that we don't need to actually build or try to create a new wheel. We need to actually put together what's fashionable, uh, what is actually uh, plausible to do now in the contemporary period so that we can then go out and deal with what we have to do in tying our brothers together. And what I'm saying to you that there's no force, there's no force that's greater than the African people pulling together. Africans have the intelligence, they have the intelligence, they're the most uh, uh, educated group that's come here, according to the white man's standards, standards, that when you check them out, they are more brighter, because the ones who come out are ones who are coming from a lot of the best uh, education they could get there, and because innately they are bright people. We had Africans, you know, in Harvard, uh, Harvard University in the 1800s from Africa. And people who come from, quote, a Bush school and come and then go through all these things, but because they have a nation oriented uh, psychology, and we don't, because we didn't have a nation, we had a job thing. We want to become a person who can come up and be part of the system. But that's the reason why Africans, Africans, when they come here, they take up the hard sciences. They take up mathematics, they take up science, engineering, all these things that will build a nation. That's the reason why when somebody mentioned about Booker T. Washington and Tuskegee, 
And people still laugh at not understand that Tuskegee was one of the greatest nation building institutions that we have ever built. And that's why Bobby was coming here, because he wanted to build actually an institution like Tuskegee in Jamaica. Didn't come in and take to take the people back. He came in because he saw that institution that got people to know how to eat. I mean, when you start talking about George Washington Carver, these are nobody for us, our people to be laughing at. Because everybody got to eat. And I, I quoted Elijah Muhammad yesterday, where you may laugh at him, but he said, and he started looking at hunger, he said that what you have to remember is that the black man has, had, has to take his stomach out of the white man's kitchen. Now that's base. Now you can't get no cut to the chase better than that. You got to take your stomach out of the white man's kitchen. Garvey, talking about education, we talking about that. Garvey says how we had to learn African fundamentalism. That's the basis of Garvey tennis. And Carlos Cooks, who was the person who revived his name, said to black people, Shortly after 1955, when we were supposed to educate the integrated school with all deliberate speed, and that ain't happened yet. He said, do you believe that the white man is going to allow